Welcome to For the Record, an unfiltered view on current trends and timeless advice for surviving in the aesthetics industry. Whether you're an injector, practice owner, sales rep, or marketer, it's time to set the record straight. Each week, we cut through the chaos and showcase diverse perspectives and winning ideas from the best minds in the industry. I'm your host, Dr. Tiffany Hall, Chief Growth Officer at Aesthetic Record. Now, let's get started on this week's episode. Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of For the Record. This is episode 37 of season two. We've got a fabulous guest today, one of the OGs of aesthetics, a dear friend of mine. He is the founder and CEO of FaceTime Aesthetics. He is faculty for the Academy of Injection Anatomy, also for Galderma and for Allergan. He's been a medical science liaison, a clinical researcher, part of faculty at the university. The list goes on and on. He has a business degree. He is a business genius when it comes to aesthetics. By the way, a gentle, warm, incredible person. Kevin Harrington, welcome to our show. Thank you. Thank you. There were such nice things. I'm not sure I believe all of them, but thank you. <laughs> well, the fun thing is I was just talking last night to Gretchen Freeling, who you know is a dear friend of mine, and she was like, that Kevin Harrington, he's just magic. He just sprinkles his little magic everywhere. So I will tell you. you it's easy, though. That's why. <laughs> Well, you are loved in the hearts and minds of our entire industry, and I've, you know, I've known you for a long time. I feel like I feel like we've gone back forever, and you have had this incredible, colorful career. You've done really every job in aesthetics. I feel like you've seen corporate, you've seen industry research, now training, owning a practice. So we've got so many things to dive into today. I can't wait to get started. Good, I'm excited. Well, let's start with that, because I think people who probably see you now don't realize the plethora of skills, i.e. you have a business degree, who knew, all the things that you're able to do. So walk us just through, at a high level, all the different kinds of things you've done in aesthetics over the last, I think, 16 or so years. And that, you know, that's interesting, it, it, you know, high level, I love it. If not, I do get caught in details, and if you know me, I'm quite verbose. So I'll try to keep it concise. If not, you say, Kevin why don't we do this? And I'll say, okay, we'll do it. But I, I would say with aesthetics, you know, I was exposed to it 19 years ago, um, really 20 when the launch of Botox Cosmetics. So they were launching a product They came over from another sales company. And a friend of mine went over and said, Hey, you got to come over to this company called Allergan. They're launching a product called Botox is for wrinkles. And she goes, you can make a lot of money. I said, sure, sounds like fun. So I went over interviewed. They hired me on the spot. The gentleman who hired me, well, unfortunately got let go about a year later, but uh, he talked about his Botox the whole time. And then he said, would you like to see your sales territory? I said, yes. So I went into the territory. Um, that was the beginning of it. That's how I got exposed to injecting and started then um, working part-time at a derm and working full-time at Allergan. And then uh, from there, uh, that was it. Then I kind of left. I got my nurse practitioner, went into practice, of course, my own. Um, so no longer working part-time, but working full-time. Um, and then uh, Galderma. They got all these new products in, which would be Disport and the whole uh, line of fillers uh, for the wrestling family. And they said, hey, they vetted me for about four or five months. And they said, would you like to be the East Coast manager for medical science liaisons? We're forming our team. So there were three of us who were more who reported to our boss, Simone. Um, so it was a very small department, but we were responsible for launching um, Silk. Uh, we were responsible for putting how to collect uh, adverse events together uh, because, you know, the foundations there at, at Galderma at the time were just used to the therapeutic side of things. So we had to put all these systems in place, still doing IITs, uh, you know, trying to help physicians and clinicians do their own little research and trying to put together how we're going to get medical information out to people. It was quite interesting. So we were responsible for hiring a team of 21 and sadly, during that time, I had a uh, death in the family, and I, uh, Gal Drummer was so gracious, my boss, Simone Howell, she's just phenomenal, but she had said, hey, you can work from the hospital, and I said, you know, I don't feel comfortable with that. I feel like I'm not devoting my time. So that was it, and I, you know, it, it, during this whole time, I was a trainer for Allergan, and um, after I left, Gal Drummer made me a trainer. Um, I worked for a company, her name, well, Jill Jones, she owns it. Um, I worked for her training company for years, AAI. Um, and then, you know, like you say, clinical research was kind of cool. I did that well before nursing, actually. Uh, and I did that. That was for five years. And that was phase two through phase four clinical trials. So it is interesting to have that background, like you said, to see, you know, I have my own business, a business degree. I have my master's in education. So curriculum development, then being a rep. And then also being the clinical research side, it, it is it, it's quite unique sometimes when I do trainings, I like it because I can be very diverse depending on who we're training and kind of where they're coming from. So I think 
it, it, it opens it up that we can really, I learn a lot from the people. And I, I think through our conversations, um, I think uh, processes get improved and, and patient outcome and safety. So I hope anyway. Well, I've watched it firsthand, so I can attest to that it does happen. But one of the things when I met you that struck me is uh, just, well, two things struck me. But the one thing that I want to talk about with clinical research is I have never seen a person who can read a research paper like you can and then turn around and lecture on it in like six minutes, literally, like immediately, and be brilliant with it. You have such a knack for understanding research. I know, you know, Silk obviously being a big launch, I'm sure that you were very busy as an MSL during the Silk days. I was a rep back then, so I remember the the blowfish lips. Um, but also, when we launched the Dysport Toxin story, I kind of led that whole process around the active toxin and all that, you know, how many how many per ml, mg, the whole, the whole story about toxin, frankly. And you helped a lot with that to help you really understand, digest the information. So you've been at this research game for a hot minute. So like from that perspective, thinking about people coming into the industry, like, I want to pick up this Botox and go inject it, pick up this, you know, this syringe of filler and go inject it. How do you help level set of like the amount of research, how to read the research? Because I find as a person on the outside, people don't read any research. They're like, oh, my rep said it works. I'm going to use it. And then they're like, wait a minute, adverse events. Well, yeah, it was all in the research. Did you not read any of the research? Nope. I just trusted the rep. <laughs> so give us like some ideas of how to become more like you on the research front. I wish and thank you for being so complimentary because you know how I feel about you also. I mean, you're brilliant. So thank you. Um, you know, it's interesting. It's actually, um, you know, aesthetic medicine, you know, there's not much regulation here in the States and it's quite frustrating. That's why I form certain things in training. But um, what it is, is going back to this is medicine. It, it, it's medical medical aesthetic. So, it, it, so we have to really look at it from a medical standpoint. If we have a drug, um, a dose-dependent drug, whether it be any of the type A's on the market, we you know we say Botox, Dysport, Juvo, Xeomin. Um, we have to understand how it works, but not, and more importantly, we have to understand where that research came from. Um, so I, whenever I do trainings, I tell them, I want you to look through the package insert. I do even before I get there. You know, if you look at the, um, the way the clinical trials were designed over time, their criteria has been more stringent on, on um, the outcomes for the patient, you know, the wrinkle severity scales, you know, plus two improvement. It wasn't that way in the beginning. But also, if you look at, uh, we call it onabotulinum toxin type A or Botox, um, when they got their approval, it was a little, um, it was, it was, I want to call it, it wasn't truly fast track, but it, it became a little quicker with the approval process for cosmetic because of the therapeutic indication in the 80s. So a lot of the safety data was used there for the, for the cosmetic indication. Um, that can be confusing if you read through the package insert because it was, they saw, remember at that time it was proof for cervical dystonia, um, blepharospasm, strabismus. So some of the adverse events that were reported, difficulty breathing, um, dysphagia, problems swallowing, diplopia, double vision, um, it was really a direct impact of what they were injecting, but we don't think that way. So I, I think I encourage the practitioners, first thing is, number one, it is a dose-dependent drug. We forget a drug. So when I educate, we talk about pharmacology. If you don't understand pharmacology, then you shouldn't be injecting anything. Um, and understand the the potential side effects. And if you think these are anticholinergics, that's what they are without the drying of the mouth, without constipation. So without some of the other uh, side effects we see with other anticholinergics. So I do do that. And dermal fillers too, because the people just don't read. You know, I always I always forget the name. You can help me because I always call it package insert. It's not with with uh, devices. It's like something package CP something or other. You can help me. What's it called? It's the IFU. IFU, thank you. I always screw that up just so you know. The IFU, I always encourage people to look through the IFU because if in their think of dermal fillers, the, the hyaluronic acid is taken from a strep positive bacterial cell wall, all right, and they purify it. But if you read the if you read the IFU, we'll talk about one of the contraindications in an allergy to, to strep positive bacteria. So you really should read this and ask why that is um, to understand so you can better apply it to patients if a patient asks you. So um, I really start there. And also clinical research, I talked about the basis of clinical research because we think about a product that was approved, um, especially like a dermal filler, right? They're gonna compare it to a filler that's also available at that time. So when, when say wrestling came out, they compared it to collagen. There was another HA here in the market that was the first one to market. So they had to use collagen as a comparator. So um, uh, also, uh, there was approval recently for one of the products from Allergan for, they called it IOH, but basically the tear trough area. And it, they, when it was designed, 
okay? When it was designed, they were using a cannula, a 27 gauge cannula was more popular. Well, now we usually use a 25 for what we consider maybe a little safer. So if we don't take into consideration when, the, when, that, when that project, when that clinical research was designed, we could come up with false conclusions. So it, it, I try to educate people on the basics so that, not to bore them, but just to say, hey, just this. And if you have questions, ask the medical science for design. They can clarify it. Well, I think you bring up a great point because I was around during the launch of the lift cannula, that, that whole thing. And, you know, people were like, how come we don't have a defined cannula? And at the time, KISS came out with that cannula. And I think what you're saying is so, so relevant and true is that whatever the study design looks like, you know, at that point, cannula wasn't a big thing yet in the U.S. They didn't start those studies, you know, four or five years ago with the cannula on board. It's like the timing is everything. But I think right now it's important because Quo, as we're hearing, is kind of everywhere with this whole um, discoloration and bruising. And, you know, I'm like, guys, read the package insert. And that study was not designed to benefit that product by any means. It was not a well-designed study when it comes to adverse event management. So I think, you know, what you mentioned about re even rheology, this – I'll, I'll give you one, the cow's milk allergy with toxin. I'm like, that is an infinitesimal amount of people. And the research shows it. Just read the freaking package insert. But I digress. But one of the things I do, <laughs> well, one of the things I do love about you, Kevin, is that you do train new injectors all the time. And you're working with Titan Aesthetics with Mary Beth Hagen. You guys have this incredible new injector program. You do it on your own all the time. Give us, you know, just a kind of a... Um, paint us a broad strokes of with new injectors right now coming in like this being one of the hurdles right like learning all the research and all the the 20 years of history that we have what are the things that you're seeing or that you're you know the watch outs for new injectors coming in that are sort of the trends that we either need to be concerned about or we need to be celebrating the trends to this point i think it's starting to change have been uh bigger training companies really there just for the money not really for patient outcome and safety um, and so when I train people who've been trained in the last 10 years or, or a little bit longer, I see this training gap. That's why I formed the, our, our uh, course. It's about 35 hours of coursework before you touch somebody. It's the why behind what you do. They're critical thinking skills, teaching at Lloyd Medicine. Um, it, it, some programs, uh, Chris Sir came out with his advanced anatomy course. So starting to get a little bit more about utilizing science and capitalizing on science for patient safety and outcome. Um, so there's some positive other, some other training companies that are making a little bit more of a positive impact. My friend Rana, she has a company that's phenomenal. Of course, my brain's going right now what it is, but there's a couple of my colleagues and it's really going back to the basic foundational learnings. Once again, we have to be very, very cognizant of patient safety and outcome, um, especially being a non-physician. Uh, the FDA is starting to really look at filler and filler complications. They brought in five, uh, supposedly, they brought in five physicians um, of varying injection times from three years to maybe 10 to comment on the, uh, the potential complications of dermal filler and what should be done. Um, that was quite interesting because you think they would have brought in people who've been injecting. I've only been injecting 19 years. I have colleagues of mine been injecting for 35. You think they would bring people in who, I don't care physician, non-physician, but specialist in the field, and they didn't. However, that brings up red flags because we were a non-regulated community here when it comes to aesthetic medicine. A lot of people are teaching who are even uh, people who own the training company, some of them are business owners or venture capitalists. Um, they may hire clinicians, but they don't know who to hire. So this is the um, what I identified as training gaps, foundational learning and safety of neuromodulators and dermal fillers in the marketplace. Uh, so that's it. But like I said, I think there's some positive trends happening. However, we've got to move quicker. Um, we really have to have more regulation. I think we should have a national um, board exam that everybody has to take, physician, non-physician. It's a specialty. Um, and, and I'm hoping that if I leave anything behind, my name is not important. It's just the impact through this course I'm teaching that will maybe one day be used in this type of board certification. I think you just hit the nail on the head. We have got to get to the place of having an aesthetics specialty or a board or someone to regulate something or to at least say, you know, which I think what you and Mary Beth are doing is like the closest thing that we have to say, this is like the core education of our industry. Like this is what you have to have at minimum to survive here as a new injector coming on. Cause they're going from the bedside to the treatment chair in many cases with very little help in between. Like they're getting hired. You mentioned VCs. We see that with PE money, VC money. There's hiring people everywhere. With no, really with no formal training of any sort in aesthetics, much less when they get there, they're not getting formal training either. But I think that as I look at this whole non-core, core, MD, non-MD discussion, it keeps coming up everywhere. I just had it this weekend with the manufacturer. Uh, I, 
I'm always baffled by this, right? That in any other industry, experience matters. Experience matters more than all the things in almost every industry. Experience, outcomes, results. Here, it's like, meh, forget it. It's the most shocking thing to me. I think it's healthcare in general, though, right? In, in corporate America, we think the opposite. If you've been here the longest, have the best results, you're the number one dog in the, you know, in the fight. But not here. And so I think that we have, to your point, as a non-injector, or I'm sorry, non-physician, you have a higher barrier of entry or a higher bar that you have to, to achieve to say that I'm good, which I think means the FDA is going to come for you first, right? I o, you know, the, the DOJ, the Inspector General, that whole group, we're the next big thing on their list after opioids are kind of wrapped up and finished. So they're coming for all of us, right, in this, this entire industry. I was just building a compliance module last night, and I'm, like, getting sick reading it about all the things like an off-label promotion or an indication that's not approved and a sales rep makes a slip of the tongue and then all of a sudden everyone's in jail and it's billions of dollars later. It's just, it's anarchy around here. So I appreciate what you and Mary Beth are doing to kind of wrap that up and get it fixed. But, you know, even as you're out for manufacturer's training, what are you seeing in offices, even from a business perspective where you're like, gosh, I wish I could just take them and shake them and say, don't do that. Like what are the big watch outs that you're seeing from just like the practice perspective? From the business perspective, I, I think... The thing is really understanding the value that the companies are providing. Um, what happens as business owners, we don't track that. And th there's a couple. So this is a major one that I see. You know, whenever a rep, I, I personally don't care about free product. I just don't. But if they give it to me, that's fantastic. But the thing is, anything they provide to my practice, if they bring a trainer in to train, that's uh, they cannot say this because they can't do tip for tat. In my records, I count that as ten thousand dollars they committed to my company. Um, that's how I that's how I value it. Um, if by chance one of their marketing programs, whether it be the Aspire program or Alley, brings in a patient, it, you know it used to cost twelve hundred dollars to bring a new patient in from a. Um, I'm not in dermatology. I'm a medical spa, so it would cost us more money from a marketing perspective, man hours and stuff. Now it's probably about two thousand. So I'll put that as if a new patient came in and they said, "Hey, I heard." about you through this program called Alley, that's $2,000. Now, a typical patient spend for a year, if I retain them, we're probably about twenty three to 2500 So there's $4,500 that company just provided value to my practice. If the representative comes in and does training to my staff, that's a dollar value. If by chance they give me a business idea to help pull through a product or um, a, a marketing idea, and I implement anything that comes from their revenue, I track. Um, I, this helps me understand the true value of the companies they're providing, and price is not my major factor for decision. I don't think it always should be. Um, you know, sometimes as business owners, we get blinded by that, but we should we should look at the overall value that someone's providing, and then choose products wisely. The other thing I see missing is. Uh, because industry or things that I see, there's two other things. One is because industry start providing training, they keep feeling like it's their responsibility for this training. Now, of course, it's always biased because it's toward a certain product and that's fine, but it's not. It's the practice owner's responsibility to provide efficient and effective training to ensure a successful business for patient retention, safety, and outcome. And recruitment, think. So it, it, the, I, it frustrates when I go into a new account and they're, they're like, oh, yeah, the business owner is going to have Allergan come in and do a training, Galderma do a training, MERS do a training. That, that's not sufficient. Those programs are not designed for a brand new person. And many of the trainers are not skilled in looking at training gaps, watching somebody and how to fill in the foundational learnings for that. I see it all the time. So there's another frustration. The other one is that you know, people go into a med spot, they don't have a clear picture of who they are. If you don't have a clear picture of who you are as a person, you cannot be very concise and clear in your mission statement with your business. It keeps you focused. And I see many times dermatology is the biggest culprit and it's okay because I don't own the business. But the thing is when they bring in, if it's a derm practice, they're clinical and they start bringing lasers in and they bring in, this can be for a med spa too, injectables. Each one of those is a separate business unit. You have to look at that way. How much growth do you want from each one? What are the expenses of each one? Where do I put my resources in order, in order to achieve the growth that I'm looking for? So I think there's a lot of business knowledge missing out there, um, but they're just a few things that I see um, when I'm, when I'm in the field training people, there's probably a lot more, but there's three different things I can at least comment on. <laughs> well, I think you make a brilliant point about industry because, you know, obviously I have a conference every year that requires a ticket to be purchased and we do trainings and, you know, lots of my friends are trainers 
And it always shocks me at what people, will, they'll balk at having to pay for a training. Like, how do you think the rest of us in the world get trained? We have to all pay to go to trainings. Like aesthetics, we've almost become enslaved to the manufacturer depending on these free trainings. But to your point, and what everyone doesn't think about is we can't go off label. We can't do adverse event management. We can't really dive into anatomy at any level beyond whatever the indication says we can talk about. So compensatory muscles, you know, vessels connecting to different things, arteries, we can't even go there. So you get kind of like half the story. And, and despite the trainers being, you know, like for you coming in, amazing trainers, you're only allowed to say and do so much. And so I think that we forget about that as, as an industry of if you get Galderma, Allergan, Merge, the best trainers on earth, you're still not going to get the whole story. But to your other point, and I had this discussion last week as well about continuing education, as a business owner, it's your job to keep your people trained and developed and, and learning and growing as an industry participant. And you need to go seek out, like you guys with the Ejection Academy, which, again, I can't say that, AIA, a phenomenal option, right? Cadaver Lab once a year, minimum, like go do it. So I think that to your point, people are starting to see it. They're starting to understand that we've got to do more as an industry. But I think that as we keep pumping money into free trainings, <laughs> people are losing sight of that's not going that should be for the experience injector right that's not that's not a newbie kind of thing but you mentioned something there that I think is really interesting is like every trainer doesn't understand new injectors what are things that you look for that's different when you assess a practice and the training gaps that maybe a person who is you know looking for more of the seasoned participant seasoned attendee what kind of what they miss yeah you know sometimes I'll start with questioning about neuro like pharmacology I'll start with some questions, not to put people in the spot. I have them write, write it down on a piece of paper and, you know, I don't have to look at them. You know, if you feel want to participate, you can participate. Some people don't want to, but I'm going to ask some basic questions. If you don't have the answers, we'll review the information. There's basic knowledge about pharmacology and neurotoxins we should cover, basic knowledge about dermal fillers that we should go over and cover. So that, that's a good way to start. And then when they get the, when I can see the way they assess the patient, I mean, our role as a trainer, like you said, if we're there for industry, we have to stay on label and we have to always consider that safety. And it's kind of odd in that position because we're balancing the relationship with the rep with the account, my relationship with them, and then my relationship and the rep's relationship with the company itself, corporate. Um, so it is, it gets a little bit, uh, exhausting at times. Um, but when they're injecting somebody, uh, you know, if you've been doing this for a while and you have a good understanding of foundational learnings, just cause we all train doesn't mean we have a great understanding of foundational learning. And as you know, in, in anything in life, as we, the more exposure and experience we get, the more we grow as a practitioner or as a business person. And, and we move into different areas. We move into different realms. We move into different perspectives. So to watch somebody, I can see if they're a newer injector because they, they're still focusing on one little area, not a global assessment. So we just take them to the next level, slowly pulling them there. You can tell when people are a little bit unsure of themselves because they'll say, is this the right place to put it? And instead you say, well, what would you think? You know, let, what does your eye see? And I tell them, I promise you at the end of the correction, I'm going to ask you if you're happy with, the, if, with your outcome and we're going to ask the patient. Now, at the end of that, if you'd like me to give you my eye, we can look together and see, but believe me, if something's a little off, I'll let you know, but if it looks fairly good to me, it's fine. So let them, people trust themselves. Um, and like I said, you can see difference people comfort level with needles or cannulas and just small little technique things. And it's always fun to work with people because I'm going to new level. So the more I work with somebody, the more I grow as a practitioner as, and as, as a teacher, if you will, I'm really a student. I'm really just a student. Um, so I continue to grow. And the more exposure I get, the more I take in to pass on to other people. So I laugh when I do trainings. I'm getting paid to learn and I'm getting paid on to pass on that knowledge for safety and patient outcome. And, and you hit on some great points, Tiffany, and you've always been very insightful um, with that looking at industry. The other thing, you know, the practitioners, the newer practitioners take these trainings for granted. They don't understand the values. I always try to bring value. I always try to tell them we're going to write down some measurables at the end of this. We have to keep track if this was of your time, if this was of value. I started doing that with presentations also. We, it, it, you sit here in your time. You're today. I'm devoting time. You're devoting time. The team is devoting time. That's money, right? It's also time out of our lives. It could be just more than money. Um, so it has to be of value to you, the team, myself, and to the people who will be listening to this. Because if not, 
then it, it was a waste of all of our time. So I always want to make sure people walk away with the measurable patient safety, patient outcome, um, comfort level with yourself. Maybe something came up during the training. It doesn't have to be for me that makes us approach life differently or people differently um, to grow. So it, it, I always have them do a measurable, which is different than I used to do. I used to do objectives. Now it, it kind of ties into an objective, but we have to have a tangible measurable. And I had the reps follow up with it. That makes them, I think, a pre, I, my thought processes, I may be wrong with the logic, I think it will make them understand the value of that training more or lack of value. And that this is just not a free gift. This is something you have to participate in. And it's, it's something that's earned. Well, I think to what you said about people taking it for granted, you know, they don't show up, they don't block time on their schedule. They're like, oh, I'll get to you in a minute. And I've flown someone half, you know, way around the world to come to them. Like that used to be the story of my life. I'm thinking, you're getting this incredible trainer to come to your front door and, and service you with all their knowledge and experience. Be grateful and take, you know, block the three hours on your schedule, for goodness sakes. But that's a whole different topic entirely. But I think one of the things that, you know, you really do well is is actual educating, like the actual act of educating another person obviously have a degree in education which didn't know that until recently by the way and so I think as we go through this podcast to your same point I like to deliver value I think part of that is saying if you're a trainer listening to this think about your curriculum what are you teaching what are your objectives and outcomes are there measurable gaps that you're trying to close and if the answer is no you know you look at CME classes you have to write all these practice you know this all these practice outcomes and all the, the training gaps you're trying to solve it's a, it's all a metric sheet basically it's all this big like excel metric sheet and if you can't prove that you're doing that you don't get CME credit and so it's not a willy-nilly thing like it might have been 10 years ago now it's kind of you know people are paying a lot of money for it. it's buttoned up well done classes but one of the things that I love that you talk about is the like aesthetic eye you know, like looking at things through this like aesthetic lens and, and assessing people I know you and Mary Beth have a whole like the first class thing is kind of based on that how do you weave that perspective in and, and teach someone in a training how to think about beautification and augmentation and you know revitalization from a perspective of a scientist and not oh she's pretty I like the way her face looks I think we get confused about that if you're not from this industry so give us some ideas on that because I, I think that part's fascinating I think you know it's interesting and it, sometimes that leads to frustration I'll explain that in a moment but um you know the, the course I always tell people and even when I train I tell everybody and I do this pull somebody famous off the internet and, and look at them, or it could be a picture of a friend, it doesn't matter, and, and look at them. So when I start the course with people who haven't done this at all, we have them look at somebody who they think is attractive or maybe unattractive in their eyes, and why? Um, to get the initial eye looking, they, they don't see subtleties of um, asymmetries. I call them imbalances of sorts, because everybody's not in balance. I've kind of gotten words out away from symmetry as much as I can. It's about imbalances. They don't see what we call sexual dimorphism, male, female type of features they just see as somebody they're attracted to and we know attraction is not only physical it, it's a chemical type of thing also so we do relieve ourselves of that um but i think what happens to when you go into somebody who's has a little bit of eye we look at ratio proportion um according to text but remember each of us is different we have to know the person in front of us you have to be a, a specialist in the aging uh, pathophysiology in order to understand how these ratios and proportions switch and what the best treatment option would be to look at this aging tissue. Um, it, it's interesting to me, um, the aesthetic eye, uh, you know, some people don't have an aesthetic eye. And I used to think that you couldn't be successful in this industry without one. Now, I'm not so sure. This is how, you know, you never say never, because I think some people are more mathematical. And I think we can, I like to challenge myself with those people because they get frustrated with the aesthetic eye because they don't quite see it that way. But when you talk in ratio proportion measurements and how it relates to the person in front of you, they can get an aha moment and understand a little differently. So, um, you know, you have a little bit of aesthetics. I used to say the perfect person is an aesthetic and also who has an aesthetic eye and a very uh, clinical mind you know, right, left brain balance, which is true, but I still think you can survive the mathematical and still get great outcomes. Now, the other thing, um, looking with the aesthetic eye, I, you have to know yourself. And I say this because we have our own ideas of beauty in our heads as injectors, what's taught to us, doesn't mean it's always true. I don't like the word cultural sensitivity. I think things, I think what it is, we don't know who's in front of us. I don't care what color you are. I don't care how heavy you are or skinny. It doesn't matter. What do you think the ideal eyebrow looks like? 
What do you think the ideal cheek looks like? What do you think the ideal lip looks like? That's what's important. So to me, that's being sensitive to the person in front of you. It's not, a, we say culture, it's so much deeper than all of that. So many times as injectors, we, we, if you don't know yourself, you'll know that you put yourself on your patients all the time. That is one thing. Oh, I, the other day I was training somebody. Oh, the ideal brow out the lateral third is, is um, spiked. Now, when I was younger, that wasn't the ideal brow with women. It wasn't. So that's, in, and I stopped her. I said, that's interesting. Why do you think that's the ideal brow? What is your thought process? Well, because that's what the books say. That's why I've heard from lecturers like so-and-so and so-and-so and so-and-so. And I said, well, that's interesting. I said, I think that's one ideal brow in beauty, but well, let's ask our patient what they think is a beautiful brow. Um, and, and we do this all, we do this with monies too. We, we put our spending habits on our patients all the time. Um, so we have to really pay attention to who we are to really excel in aesthetics because the better we know ourselves, the better our consultative process is, the better our patient outcomes are because we meet their needs and we don't put ours ahead of theirs. Well, you mentioned a thing there that I want to go back on because, Kevin, this is one that keeps me up at night, especially with a with meeting and thinking about curriculum is the, bra the whole brow discussion. We talk about on Instagram all the time. I say we industry collectively like, oh, I'll tell patients no all the time. You know, I don't do this. I don't do that. And I think to myself, okay, if it's a ridiculously big lip or some crazy dysmorphic looking thing, I'm here for that. I get it. Say no. But what if they just have a different perspective of beauty than you? Do you say, no, I don't do that brow? And the patient says, but that's the brow that I want. At some point, we have to decide, are we going to put our heels in the sand and dig and say, no, my ideal of beauty is whatever Kevin Harrington said one day in a, you know, in a show that I watched. Or the patient, her beautification perspective of herself is this other is her when she was 20 and by the way brows when you were 20 aren't brows like they are today right it's different to your point when do we when do we decide that the patient no longer has any say in how they look and that it's only up to whatever you've learned in your training to dictate the patient's idea of beauty like I struggle with this concept non-stop because like I don't want them to walk out of the door looking ugly and hideous and that have my name on it right if I'm an injector but also I want to give them what they want within reason because that's what they came in there for is for me to give them what their idea of beauty actually is. So what are your thoughts on that controversial topic? You know, it's interesting. I, I'm reading, I, I, when I, I went to a Catholic university for two years, so we had to take three semesters of philosophy. I'm reading a philosophy book and you ask, a, you, you pose a very philosophical question, right? We could really go on and on about this, but I'm going to keep it more concise and not be like a philosopher and go into all these little, uh, these little uh, off takes we can go. I, I, you know, we all, do what we feel is right for our patient, we should. That's number one. If not, don't do it. But I believe that we also have to understand that there are certain hard stops that we have to adopt. My hard stops are things that go outside that distort a ratio and proportion. That's my hard stop. Now, that doesn't mean that I'm not going to augment a lip to the point where maybe I think it looks a little fuller. If I do that, I'm going to balance it somehow. Um, so that's my hard stop. Now, with that being said, it also depends on the patient in front of us. What happens if I'm doing a transgender and it's a female to uh, say a male to female, I may have to exaggerate search certain features and, and atrophy other features. So is that an extreme change for that? It is, it is an extreme change, but I'll still keep them within that, that uh, ratio and proportion within a more feminine face. Um, so that's my hard stop is, is ratio and proportion of the person in front of me. We can't take, you know, I, I see people correcting to phi. You know, I, I took a course years ago with, um, it was called Aesthetic Blueprint. Yes, with Remington. And um, it was funny, I mentioned Remington Swift. It was wonderful. I mean, it was, there's some great things. And, and the thing is, it's good to have these things as guides. But one thing was interesting and I didn't have a chance to see the, the pictures went too quickly. Remington was showing before and afters of all his patients. There was, he masculinized them. It was like, boom, boom. And every single one, it was masculinized. I don't know why, but once again, it was only the selection of the models he picked. So I'm not sure this is across the board. It was just a trend I saw within five pictures. So it may not be true at all, but I like to bring that up because that's what my eyes saw. So that was developed on inanimate objects things that were stationary, not a dynamic face. So these ideas are good to have in the back of our head that we should look at. If you believe someone's chin is recessed, assess it, the Rydell or Ricketts. Look at the width of the chin, absolutely, and see where they fit. And then look at the total shape of the face, though. Someone may have a slightly thinner chin, 
a male that we think should be about the width of the oral comma shirt, but it's imbalanced with the rest of his face. So maybe I won't touch it because it would imbalance the face. So to me, ratio and proportion is my hard stop. It always has been. I think that's our hard stop in fillers because when we go outside is when people say, God, that person has a big mouth. That person has duck lips. That person's cheeks are huge. Or, oh, that person had their cheeks done. It, it, we, we've kind of broke that little hard, for me, that's my own opinion, that hard stop is ratio and proportion. Um, so it, I'm not sure if I answered the question directly, but that's kind of how I approach um, patients. And, and, you know, if somebody wants some extreme stuff, you know, Leslie Fletcher does a lot, thank goodness. She's doing more on the psychological components and body dysmorphia and things like that. You know, in the United States, we don't have that as part of our approval process. In many states, in many countries, they do. Um, doing a, basically a psych eval, if you will. It's actually part of clinical trials. We don't have that. So I think we need to also look a little bit like that or also talk to our patients because maybe the distortion comes because they're going through a recent death of a spouse who they were married to for 50 years. So, you know, the consultative process is about discovering who that is in front of you, how they think, you know, immediate gratification, not what's going on in your life, what is your social history? All of this comes into play. And the consultative process did not exist when I started. We had collagen and Botox. We didn't do a consultation. You know, we either had fine, we had fine lines or superficial lines and deep lines. We didn't do cheeks. You know, we did we did Botox all over. At that time, I'm saying Botox is that was the only one that was available. So um, for the type A's, but it, so that's my, I'm not sure if it's a clear answer, but it's just how I look at it and some of my thoughts on, um, on this, um, maybe going outside of areas of comfort. But a lot of times we go outside, we don't want to go outside areas of comfort because we don't have the training to do it. So you have to know, when I said know yourself, you have to understand why your actions are what they are and be truthful with yourself. It comes from knowing who we are and that really impacts our patient outcomes and knowing who the patient is. Ask questions. Uh, you said two things there that I want to point out. I think if you put, put together right now a list of 50 celebrity women who are thought to be beautiful and you did the whole phi ratio thing on them, you would find that they have massive swings in the differences of those ratios because what people think is beautiful is totally different. Like I love sometimes more of a masculine jawline on a female and a little dimple on her chin. I think it's gorgeous. Yeah, that, that look. And I also love an Angelina Jolie look, right? And a Kim Kardashian look. Like I love all kinds of different looks. I think different things make people beautiful in different ways. But it's funny you mentioned Remington because the year I went, he was knocking on every masseter in a 50-mile radius. So it was um, – everyone was feminized – that every picture he showed because he had just gotten into this like master thing and so all the bnas no one had any masters left at all they were just gone but i think the other part of what you said you know the an animate object part of it that five may not be the best thing always you know in all cases but thinking about transgender we do a lot of that here in a set of record as far as the conference it's a big part of what we present this year for sure last year as well and the year before is a good faith exam kevin this makes me a crazy person people write that thing off like it's just oh i gotta do a good faith exam mf or i hate that thing you know, it's just like it's a pain in my ass i'm like this is what you need to be doing like who's going to do the assessment psychologically that all the health systems i mean you're a guy that talks about systems all the time I, i've listened to you talk about this looking at all these different parts and pieces so that when the rn's in the room who doesn't have perhaps the same level of even of access to prescribe in the event of an emergency, right? Like I think about that being the big thing. It's like they can't prescribe and there's an emergency. Let's hope that you've written down all the things as a PANP or MD, DO who did the good faith exam to know what to do next. But anyway, point being, use that consultation time to, to not only consult and look at money and all the fun, wonderful things, but also to do a true exam of the patient. Like make that make that thing have value. It makes me crazy. Like we're wasting an opportunity there to uncover real issues that we need to tackle before we start pumping people full, full of filler and sculpture and toxin. Tip, you're, um, you're, you're on the same soapbox. That's what drives me nuts. Um, I, all my exams, I do review of systems. This is a medical treatment. I get full surgical history. Do you have any implants? What happens if someone had a total knee and they're having an infectious process or even if they had, uh, you know, if they had like a breast implant and they're having an encapsulation, which we know is biofilm, we don't pay attention. We don't ask. They're having an infectious process and we inject a, a, an implant in their face, a dermal filler. Well, guess what? More than likely it may seed and we may have some issues. We have to understand we should be doing a physical exam. We learn it in medicine. You inspect, you palpate, check capillary refill, check skin integrity, look for dehydration, check for uh, extra ocular movements, check visual acuity. We should, it's medicine. So I get infuriated. Talk about social history. 
No one asks social history. You better because you're injecting muscles that can impede upon daily activities of these people. And truly, you can decrease function. That's where you get into some, some trouble, you know, for lawsuits and things. So this is medicine. Treat it as medicine. How many times do people come in? They ask, aller okay, what's your allergy? Oh, penicillin. Okay. Well, what is the allergy? Now, the problem is not problem. The, the hard part is RNs aren't trained in, in the chief complaint problem list way that we are. That's how this should be approached. The chief complaint is what the patient sees and would like to look at and maybe address. The problem list is what I'm seeing as a specialist in aging, hands, chest, neck, face, earlobes, eyebrows. What I'm seeing is the number one thing that's aging them a little quicker. That's my role. That's my job. That's what I'm here for. In medicine, if you came into family practice and you said your elbow hurt, but your blood pressure was 200 over 120, I don't care much about your elbow at that time. If someone's aging here faster than here, this will be part of my treatment plan. This is my number one. Now, my number one and your number one may not match. We don't always need to treat it. So if I bring something up, I tell my patients, you don't have to treat it. If it doesn't bother you, don't. But it's my responsibility to make sure that we're aware. And also, many times I uncover things they didn't know we could treat. So, Mirad, so I'm in totally in your camp. It drives me nuts. They separate this from medicine. It is medicine. And, and when you say this stuff, nutraceuticals, what, what type of nutraceuticals are, are they on? What medications? Okay, so they're on an ACE inhibitor, an ACE inhibitor and they get angioedema. We're going to assume, we're going to assume that it's um, the, you know, the lip filler. Well, it could be their ACE inhibitor. So you have to understand now the RNs, remember, they're not trained in that process, but as a registered nurse, which I've been for 30 plus years, we are trained in something called nursing diagnosis, which is the same idea. So I think as trainers, we have to understand the training and try to change the way we approach it. So maybe with a nurse, I'll say, you know, I speak this way. If it doesn't make sense, let me know. Now, many people don't want to admit that. So I say, let's look at this nursing diagnosis. You go into a patient who's bedridden. We have an alteration in skin integrity. We have um, an alteration in um, uh, pulmonary, whatever. And I forget all the nursing diagnosis, but we have nursing diagnosis. Which one would be number one? Well, this would, why? Because that's the one that's gonna be most detrimental to the patient, same in this. Not the most detrimental, but the one that's aging closer to the chronological age, that would be your number one. So as trainers, we have to understand also the educational training of the people we're training. You know, physicians, PAs, and Ps are all trained in the medical model. We know chief complaint, we know problem list, you know, but, and, and nurses know how to examine a patient. They know how to inspect, palpate, auscultate, so they understand that process also, but we do have to understand the differences in training and what that means to our patients and how to relate that to somebody who doesn't have the same background we do and, and to make it so it's, it, it's transferable over to the patient. Well, it brings up two things for me. One being that we're all going into this like functional medicine thing now with testosterone and you know, we're looking at all these other, you know, stem cells, more complex looking at, you know, Stephen Swords, like he's my guru, all the things that he's doing. That requires a much more involved medical exam to decide what someone's testosterone number should be. Like, hello, if you've been on the wrong side of that, trust me, I have been and gained 35 pounds from it. You don't want that to go wrong. But the second thing is if the boards come in and look and you have nothing that shows that you are a medical clinic, that you're just slinging filler like it's your job. That's a cause for concern. And we had Ernice Williams here a few weeks ago. She's uh, an attorney and a nurse. She's like, they just need one reason. They just need it. She's fantastic. If she, if they just, if they get one reason to look at you. Social media, false claims, you know, food, FTC, what you've violated, anything you've done. One reason and the whole hood comes back, the curtain peels back and everything is exposed. So she had, you know, really good ideas. Like you just got to button it all up like because you are a, Think about yourself as a family practice, an oncologist, a cardiologist. What would he or she do? Go do that because that's medicine. So I just think there's, there's like a different mentality, I think. But to that point, it's sort of changing gears here to the business side of it, I think it's a similar issue. Go from the bedside to the treatment chair. You've gone from taking orders, running someone else's, you know, diagnosis and chief complaints and problem list, to now you're going to be the business owner the seller of all the things, the, the lead talent, the CEO, the janitor, the HR person, all the things. How does that process unfold for someone? Because, I mean, you're running a very successful clinic. What do you offer people in the way of, like, business training, business coaching? Where should they go get resources and learn how to become more, you know, frankly, more like you? Well, it's interesting you say that because that was one thing we identified, me and about 13 colleagues. We formed a, uh, a group called Aesthetic Masterminds. Um, and it was, it's headed by Don Segrillo and Haley Wood. Um, there's uh, all of us, uh, they're just amazing practitioners and amazing people and amazing businesswomen. 
Um, I'm the only businessman, but that's good. It's nice to be a minority for a change, but it's been nice. We formed it because we just got together as me being a smaller business owner, our colleague Lovely being a larger business owner. Um, and we, we all struggle with the same things, protocols, this time management, how do we hire, how do we fire, um, how do we set a practice up, how do we set protocols up, what, what can we do to protect ourselves, how do we go through an audit, you know, through the IRS. Um, it, it, so we would bring speakers in and we get educated and life coaches and, and uh, looking at, um, you know, different types of uh, financial statements and what they mean, what does a PL really look like, what does it mean, what's, you know, so... It, looking at all of this. So what we did uh, last year was our first conference we did for business owners. We, we are very selective. You have to be in, uh, I don't remember all the criteria, but I think you have to business in more, less, more than a year or two, and you have to have at least three employees or more. And we will, not that we hand select because we're being snotty, but we don't want people in, try, we try to keep people out of the same geographical region so you feel comfortable speaking about finances and your own struggle. So we, we had the conference last year. It seemed very successful. Um, we have another one this year coming up uh, at the end of this month, I believe. Um, so it is, it's a great uh, resource, aesthetic masterminds. Um, and that's what we did for business owners because we have to be educated. But think of, you know, uh, physicians have been in this position ever since they started practicing, right? They go for medical school, they go into practice. No one knows business. Now, the other thing is realize, know, you're, know what you're not great at. It's okay. You know, we have to understand basics, but maybe something we just don't grasp, like QuickBooks. You get somebody in there who is a specialist who can do that for you. Then you top end it. What is the most important or the most important reports I want to see for the health of my business and to ensure that people maybe are not taking product or money from me? And they'll then guide you so you can top end things because we can all figure that one out, right? So once again, know who you are. It comes back to knowing who you are. I think having the tribe, you know, I'm really close with Amy Burke and Stam at Glowderma and Gretchen, obviously G Face. Just this past weekend, we're or last week, we're texting about HR and hiring and what a, you know what a process it is to hire an onboard. Like, oh, ladies, I use XYZ system for aesthetic record. It, everything is automated. I do XYZ. The next day, they both had a demo call. They both signed up for the system. Just by at, just by saying, I have a problem. Does anyone on this text string know how to fix my problem? And I'm like, yes, I have a solution for you. And they were willing to trust me enough to say, I'll book the demo and I'll go try it. The issue I think that we find is that people believe you, but they don't have the balls to go actually do anything about it. To say, I heard that you told me I should hire a person to do QuickBooks, but gosh, I don't want to spend the money and I don't really know. It's like, no, it's worked for me. Just trust me. I would not give you bad information if I can avoid it. Go try it and see if it works for you. I think... That's why I think the masterminds, because it's such a group of strong people who really know and your presence is so commanding that they can't turn away from you, right? They're like, if they all said it's the thing to do, I should go do that thing. So I think you guys have power in numbers, which is great. By the way, I did not qualify to attend. I've tried for two years, but. Well, I'll make sure you're on the list. I'll tell everybody. I'll see if I can. The other thing is. <laughs> Also, if you have other resources, please, please announce them. You know, I have certain ones and we know that there's consultants out there. There, you know, we have a list of them. And, and with your program that you just mentioned, you know, as a set of record, if there's benefits that please, please talk about it because it's important for me to know because when I do trainings, I try to educate people saying, here are some resources for you that are resources that you can count on and, and they're legitimate resources. Unfortunately, with social media, we can't differentiate between the two anymore. It's very difficult. Oh, that's a Kevin. That's a podcast that would take me four hours to go through. But I think the problem people perceive with us here is we're a huge business. I'm like we're a very small business. I run all of our social media. I do all of our graphic design. I build our website. Like, you know, I think when you are part of that small business world, you become very scrappy, and you you find you have to find these people who help you do certain things because you can't do all of it. So it's like trust the guys who are successful and small. They have found a way to diversify their talent pool. In an affordable, in an affordable manner. And tip, and just say, I'm going to say something for you because you know I just respect you so much. Not only are you brilliant, but you probably do the work. And just so you guys know, Tiffany, I worked with her at Galderma, and what she did in such a short amount of time, um, a team of 20 couldn't have done. So it, it is quite. I, I still, and I was talking to Gretchen, and and I said, I don't know how. I still, I'll never understand how you do it. It's just not part of who I am. So uh, I just want to say kudos to you, but also. I, I love what you're sharing. When you have a smaller business, we, we have to wear many hats and we have to understand what hats fit and what don't. And then we have to find resources and we have limited budgets. So you're right, the scrappy ones. We're the ones who can say, hey, this is where I use. They did a good job. And we have, that's why we did the masterminds. Like, who to use for website design? Who to use for content? Who to use for this? Because we don't have endless budgets. We really don't. And we have to decide where to spend those where we want to spend our monies and, and what that looks like. But we do know when we form a business, we have to have, there's foundational things that have to be in place 
in order for you to even open the doors that will make your life so much easier than trying to backtrack because then you just collapse, right? Foundation has to be strong. So I love that. So I just want to say, please always share resources. Uh, I have a list. I don't remember. I'm really bad with names, but I keep a list of resources. So same because people ask all the time, who does this? Who does that? Who does you know this editing or this Canva thing or Fiverr? But you know, I, if you guys have not checked out the Aesthetic Mastermind group and you qualify to attend that thing, you better get your butt there because it's fantastic faculty who have I don't know hundreds of years of experience in this industry to combine and have such great expertise and successful practices. So definitely go there. But as we kind of wrap up here, I want to go through one more thing because this is one of the, my favorite Kevin things in the world. And I wish I could fit it into Aesthetic Next. I'm still working on it. Is you have a lecture about scrotox, which at the time. And it was, what, three, four years ago this kind of started happening where it wasn't really a thing yet, right, to talk about P shots and O shots and all the deals. But beyond just the scrotox Talks idea, I think it's more of you're fearless on stage. You are an incredible presenter who can command a room with one slide. You know, I'm the same way. I'm like, I don't really need a slide deck. It's there for support if you guys want to watch it. But just let me talk. You're very similar to me. Well, how did you become that way? Because what I'm finding with Aesthetic Next is we, you know, I like to find that raw talent and bring them on stage and let them shine is they're struggling to figure out how do I present? What should be on my deck? How do I how do I lead a crowd down the mountain with me, you know, to better pastures? Like they don't know how to actually deliver the information. So tell us how you got so good at this to be able to talk about scrow talks on stage and all the great things that you put together. Like how do you build your lectures, your process? Do you practice in the mirror? Give us give us the Kevin story. I, I, thank you. I, I'm an introvert by nature. I was very bad with public speaking. I, I couldn't even do it. When I did clinical research, that's where I started. I'm still an introvert. If you don't know, people think I'm extrovert. I'm not. I'm an introvert, total introvert. You are, you are also, I think, right? Even though we were always extroverted with our stuff. But I think what happened over time, uh, there's certain activities I did that kind of allowed me to be in front of people. Um, larger groups for me are sometimes easier. I can put it basically a scrim up and I can just look out. I still connect with people. So what I've done, this is how I've done it. I wanted to actually start a course uh, called um, Lecturing is Speaking from Your Heart. That's where it starts. So yes, you have to have your content, do your research, rely on your medical science liaisons, have that down. But the thing is one, know your story. It's a story. You have to tell a story, right? So that's why we don't use slides. We have our story. And the hardest thing is how do I, this is whatever I present. I just said the other day, I'm like, how? I don't have my story yet. I need my story because it's my story, how I'm presenting this. It may be a deck from Galderma or Allergan. I have to make that my story. If not, it will come across as me reading slides. So how do I make it my story? And then what are some impactful things that I want to get across? What are my goals? I, you'll see me on stage. I bring a piece of paper out with me. I'll look at it, make sure I don't miss stuff. Or when people say something, I'll write it down. I was doing it today when you're speaking. I write things down so I can go back. And I don't, it's fine. Um, but I, I think be you. If you speak from your heart, people listen. If you speak from a the slide, they don't. You know, so you speak from your heart. It's a story that you apply to make it and, and transitioning. I notice that people sometimes don't transition from the topic to what it means and how it, how it extends into clinical practice or your, or your life. So make that connection or help with that connection. And, and I don't, I always, I, I don't, I appreciate your kudos with how I present. I, I guess I don't perceive myself that way. I just, I'm just me up there. I, I'm not there for people to know who I am it's not why I do it. I do it truly to help patients. That's my goal. So have your clear goal who you are and speak from your heart and know your story, whatever you're presenting. And I think, like you said, I don't need a bunch of slides because they, I can use them as reinforcement. And you've always taught me that. Put it up there if you want to reinforce a message. Absolutely. I was just did that the other day. So see, you always stay with me too. But that's, that's my advice. If you're afraid to speak on stage, start. Contact me. I'll help, to help you through it, you know, but also when I present, I have to connect to people. You'll see, I don't usually stand on stage. I walk because I want to see you. I'll, I'll touch you. I'll look at you. What is your name, Kate? Oh, Kate, it's so nice to have you here. Here's a question I pose to you if you don't mind answering it. You know, it, this gets me my, that, what, I can't personally touch 300 people, but I try through these small touches to feel like everybody's connected energy wise. They feel like I'm connecting with them. That's my goal. Well, I think you're much like me. You're a very physical presenter. I walk, I'm high, I'm low, my arms are going out. I use different voices and octaves. And 
I think people listen to you when you <clears throat> when you sound interesting. It's like going to the library for a reading when you're a kid. When the person does all the voices and they're fun and you know, as a little kid, you're like, oh, this is great. This is so great. Versus they just read everything monotone. We do a lot here about don't read your slides. Like, oh my God, if it's already on the slide, I can read. I have an education. Don't read it to me. That makes me crazy. Yeah, like I could just just send me the deck and I'll pre-read and be done. Like I don't need to actually come to your talk. So I think there's all these like nuanced things. As every year, as about this time, I'm starting to go through decks and get people ready to go and. It's like I wish someone would come into the industry. We had we had actually a workshop for this last year at AN about how to present on stage. Like, don't read your deck. You don't need 57 slides. You know, don't try to squeeze it all in. Don't put up a million pictures that mean nothing. Connect the so what to what you're saying. Because I think what you just said about the transition of here's all the, the clinical data, for instance. What does that mean to me as now a practitioner? And I think anatomy is a great example of that. Like in anatomy lab. You can present anatomy all day long, but who cares if it doesn't relate back to me as an injector? And I can't think about on Monday morning in my clinic in my chair that what you just mentioned is blindness. It is, you know, an a potential occlusion. Like I got to figure that out. I think there's a we missed the educational connection point. But that's the thing I've taught as a professor for many years. You have as well, so you kind of learn that part of it, you know. But anywho, I digress. So before we roll off here, because I could talk to you all day long, any big things coming up in your world that you want to discuss? Like I know you have AIA, AIA courses all the time. You have your own courses. Give us where to find you next besides Aesthetic Next, which you'll for sure be there. Give us all the all the deets. You know, I just finished a place called, it was BeautyCon. Um, I, I was shocked. Uh, this woman, Renata, runs it. She had asked me. I was up there training her and her colleague and her staff. And uh, she had asked me to present. And I love Renata. She's such a wonderful person. She's a nurse practitioner. Um, and she would you like to present. I'm like, oh, sure. Why not? I had no idea what this was, just so you know. It was a phenomenal conference. Um, it's my colleagues who've been in the industry, some of them for years, my, the first person, Connie Brennan, um, I'd first trained with a gentleman named Fred Brandt, Frederick Brandt, a dermatologist. I was very fortunate to watch him inject for the very first time. He was also the number one and the largest customer in the world when I first started. Um, and he was, I was privileged to watch and then he injected very differently. But Connie said, Kev, why don't you come up and look to see if there's something you really want to get into? So she opened up, but she was there. Um, Leslie Fletcher, um, myself, uh, I don't consider myself into the same realm because they've been injecting longer than I have. I've only been 19. Um, a gentleman, George Baxter Holder was there. Hermine Warren was there. Um, who else? And Allie was there. Michelle was there. Just people who've been really impactful in the industry and, and professional and have to work really hard to ensure that we're knowledgeable so, it, so we can also always um, be looked at um, in that way by, by the uh, profession itself. So that was amazing. Uh, of course, uh, thank you for inviting me to Aesthetic Next. You always give me great topics. So that would be great. Yes, Aesthetic Next. Um, what else? I'll be doing uh, uh, Christy Lennox's course. Uh, there, uh, It's the Aesthetic Extender Symposium. I'll be there. And I believe there's another another place I'm speaking at. This is terrible. I try to do about four or five a year, but um, it gets, oh, then also the uh, it, the International side for Plastic Surgery Nursing has been, uh, um, of course, they changed the name, so I was fearful I'm saying the old one, uh, but I'll be doing that. That's a nice conference. Um, uh, unfortunately, that one's a little selective because the PAs aren't included, and I don't believe in aesthetic medicine. We exclude anybody, but just so you know, they are working. That's the only organization that has a national certification in, in aesthetics, but they are working on trying to open it up so everybody can be open to take it, just so you know. So, because we've been pushing really hard, I, I don't see differentiates between PAs and NPs and RNs and MDs. We're just specialists in, in the field. Um, so I, that's how I believe, but uh, that's coming. I just want to always say that about that organization, that that's, there are specific to RNs and, and NPs. Um, but mind you, all my colleagues who are PAs, we're doing things to open things up because it, it, it aggravates me. But once again, that, that exam was formed for a certain reason and it was very different when it first formed. So just wanted to open that up. So yeah, a lot of stuff's coming up. Still with Chris Surik, that's going on, which I love. Um, I don't know, just... I'm hoping that um, hopefully next year, last year, a couple of years I did international. So hopefully that will open up soon again, some international stuff, which I love. Well, I think one of the things you just mentioned about your faculty, at, um, I think it's called Modern Beauty Con, which is such a cool name, is it's all the OGs who are eager to train, always say yes. I think that's the difference in the newbies and the, and the OGs. For Aesthetic Next, for sure, all the like historical legend people are like, oh yeah, I'm there. I don't care what you pay me. If you even pay me, I don't care. I'm, I'm going because I understand that the industry is better because I'll present. And I, I have things to offer that I want to share. 
or I'm scared of something that I'm seeing and I want to correct it on stage, you know, that kind of thing. Versus I see the newer people who don't have the don't have the history, Kevin, don't have the experience like, oh, it's going to cost you X, Y, Z. I would not do that on stage. I don't like that topic. I'm not doing that workshop. I'm very choicey and dicey. I'm like, you won't make it here. We eat our young and you'll be one of the young that we eat because unless you can be flexible and agile, people will not work with you. Industry won't work with you anymore. They won't they won't want to deal with your diva. Conferences can't afford you because we don't make, we don't print money at conferences. It costs a fortune to put on a conference. Like you are pricing yourself out of the market here, sister. So I feel like I want to tell people, look at Kevin and Connie and Julie and, you know, that whole group, Don, Haley, all of them and say, what are they doing and how have they managed to stay relevant for 20 plus years? Ah, oh, because they are eager to be involved all the time, eager to be involved. That's the difference. And it's true. And I, I and that's why I always appreciate when you invite me. I always still think of it as an honor and not a, you know, to be there. Um, and, and some, like you said, you give us topics. I love it sometimes because sometimes, hey, here's something I was thinking about. Oh, I'll do it. You know what I mean? Because then I just say, because then I learn. Does that make sense? Because I can learn and say, oh, this is something I didn't think about. I do this in practice and I can take all that information for myself and colleagues and present it. So I agree with you. I, it, 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 the diva thing, I don't understand it. I truly don't because my colleagues have been doing this for 20 plus years, 30 plus years. They're not like that. Many of them, you wouldn't even know who they were. Neil Ford's been doing it for 35 years. You know, Deb Thompson, there's people we don't even know. Um, and, and we're about educating and patient. We're about patient outcome and safety. That's, and we have a passion for that. So I, I appreciate you saying that. And I hope I always come across that way, you know, cause it's true. I, it, it doesn't matter if you know who I am, that the name doesn't, that doesn't resonate with me. It just doesn't. If I could do everything I do with a scrim in front of me or a, a block, I, I'd love to do it. Well, I think the fun thing about the Russian roulette is like, I, I can talk about anything. Give me a topic. I want to stretch and grow and make a new lecture about something totally random. I never want to give the same lecture twice. I hate that. I'm like, I want to have a repertoire of 50 lectures that I can do and all kinds of things. I think it's just more fun. But anyway, give us your social handle, website, how to find you whenever we hang up with our lovely podcast today. You guys remember, I'm not a social media person, but it's my uh, Instagram. If you DM me, I won't even know what that means. I apologize. You'll have to get me on Facebook Messenger, but it's FaceTime Aesthetics. Um, it goes under uh, both. That would be for uh, both the, uh, the uh, my it, my my website, the URL is ftaesthetics.com, so F-T-A, and then my handle is FaceTime Aesthetics on Instagram, but I apologize if I don't get back to you because I really, I don't get it. I, my patient population is 68, 10% don't even use Facebook, the other 90% use Facebook, and they don't use it very well, so I don't have, I know I should look at Instagram more of an educational tool to help people, but my friend Julie Bass Kaplan, a lot of my other colleagues who I love to death are doing that. So I figured let them do that. Maybe once in a while I'll make an appearance. So um, I, yes, but either way, following me is kind of weird. I, I'm just so whatever. Titan Aesthetics may be recruiting because then you always know what's going on. Uh, a colleague of mine are going to be doing a national tour. We were going to do this year, ran uh, Russia, but we're going to do it next year. So we're going to do a national tour. So that'd be fun. So maybe on there also, and, and also uh, Titan Aesthetic Recruiting. She has, uh, Mary Beth uh, Hagen has all of the upcoming conferences on there. So it is a good place just to go as a resource, uh, just to look what's going on. But, and Tiffany, thank you for everything you're doing. Everything you've done since I met you for the industry has been phenomenal. And I don't think you all know, Tiffany really was, as far as I'm concerned, a spearhead looking at um, anatomy, facial anatomy and injections and how to capitalize on the anatomy for patient outcome. Um, she really started that in, as far as I'm concerned, maybe I'm out of speaking out of turn, but I believe you were the person behind that with Lucy, with his now Gia, creating that um, with Dr. Surik. So I just want to say thank you. And now with Aesthetic Record, the contributions you're making to the industry is fantastic, even though a lot of times you're behind the scenes and people don't know everything you everything you have done and everything you're working on. So I appreciate everything you're doing. It's 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 all for patients and that's what I appreciate. Well that's so nice, Kevin. I thank you for noticing. But yeah, I became obsessed with anatomy and people like you helped me bring Lucy to life and Chris was so involved. It worked out well. Now now look at Gia. She's all grown up and she's got her own life and she's left left the nest. But Left the nest, but thank you for all you're doing as well. And, and if people have not met you yet and been around you and listened to you speak, guys, go right now. Find the conferences Kevin's at. Sign up for them. 
come to Static Next, go to Masterminds, like find where he's at because what he has to share is so valuable. If you haven't figured that out today already, then you know, go to the next thing. You'll you'll keep just learning and learning and learning. But Kevin, for the record, you've been a fantastic guest today. We have loved having you on. It's like getting to talk to my old friend for a whole hour is wonderful. And I cannot wait to see you in September. And in the meantime, I better find a place to sit down with you and hug your neck between now and then. I can't wait to do it. I hope so. And thank you for doing this venue, too. I, I really appreciate it. And you're the best. And I love seeing you and spending this time with you. We don't get to spend this time together. And it's been so uh, relaxed. And I appreciate it. And thank you to the team who's helped put this on, too. Well, guys, we'll see you next week for episode 38 of For the Record. Thanks for listening to another episode of For the Record. This podcast is not intended to provide legal or medical advice. It's for entertainment, education, and information purposes only. For more information on this week's guest or to get started with Aesthetic Record, email us at info at aestheticrecord.com. Be sure to tune in next week for more fresh perspectives on disrupting the status quo and surviving in the aesthetics industry.